I'm not a historian and I'm not a sociologist and I'm not a philosopher either. Um, I'm just <laughs> your average theoretical physicist. And I guess the reason um, I ended up at this meeting is that I wrote a book, uh, which is called Lost in Math. And I apologize to the British part of the audience for the lack of an S. <laughs> Though, as you can see in the top right corner, the French, for some reason, used the English title in the British spelling. So um, this book is very much a personal story. It's my own story. Um, I was trying to figure out uh, what criteria I should use to pick a research topic. And my work has mostly been um, in the foundations of physics, um, by which I, broadly speaking, mean those areas where we're concerned with the really, really big questions, like questions like, what is time? How did the universe begin? What is matter made of? That kind of stuff. Um, so all of what I'm about to say is really about the foundations of physics, not about physics in, in general. Um, as you can see, the subtitle of the book was How Beauty Leads Physics Astray, um, and uh, writing a popular science book, so this was my first popular science book, has certainly been an interesting experience in that I found out there is a significant fraction of people who think that by reading the title of a book, they can tell what comes in the 300 pages afterwards. A lot of those people got away with the idea that I'm saying... Scientists shouldn't talk about beauty. Talking about beauty is bad, bad, bad. Don't do it. Now, I would like to think that the opinion that I expressed in the 300 pages that followed the title was a little bit more nuanced. Um, there are many reasons that scientists talk about beauty, and I'm certainly not saying all of them are bad. Like, we've, we've heard many of those reasons already. Um, for example... It's a motivation for them. It's an inspiration. It gets them into science. And um, I traveled around for my book and I interviewed a lot of uh, physicists and they brought up all kinds of uh, reasons for me, um, to me, about why they um, like to talk about beauty. You can find them in the book. I'm, I'm going to pick one in particular, which um, already came up. So this is a quote from um, Germann, who won the Nobel Prize for um, the quark model. And he said uh, in a TED talk, what is especially striking and remarkable is that in fundamental physics, a beautiful or elegant theory is more likely to be right than a theory that is inelegant. And um, this might sound really familiar to you now, because you, if you remember Penrose's uh, quote, um, which came up in an earlier talk, was pretty much exactly the same. And I could go on like for half an hour <laughs> with quotes like this. It's a very, very common attitude that you find in, in uh, the foundations of physics. And I've grown up believing this because everybody says it. And you, um, I mean, when I say grow up, I mean grow up academically. <laughs> Um, it's like it's like really common that people tell you this, like that your sense of beauty is a good guide to the development of new models, to our understanding of nature. Um, and I, I, I this to me is kind of weird <laughs> that I stand here and say this today because it doesn't make any sense. You know, once you start thinking about it, you you begin to wonder why should it be the case. Right? Why can I use my sense of beauty to kind of magically figure out what's a good theory of nature? But I think the thing is that I never thought about it. It's just that so many people told me this, I never questioned it. And there, there are lots of problems connected to this um, because, as uh, Ben said in the very beginning, um, our notion of beauty dictates to some extent what kind of questions we even ask uh, and also what kind of answers. Um, we are willing to accept. Uh, in, in, in the foundations of physics in particular, um, what's happened is that pretty much everyone uses the same notion of beauty, and that leads them to discard a large number of theories, um, which, which is really a problem. And um, what's happening there is that we use this notion of beauty, which we um, have learned to identify in successful theories, and then we try to use it to develop new ones, but this keeps us getting stuck um, with the same type of theories and it's just not working. 
And I always refer um, people to um, James' uh, book about um, how the notion of beauty may change uh, with paradigms. Um, so it's a pleasure to finally meet him after I've referred to his book so many times. Um, there are many examples um, in the history of science and in physics in particular, where what's changed in a paradigm shift was actually our notion of beauty. Um, and he already said, um, quantum mechanics is an ex example, but there's also been um, the shift from a more mechanical worldview um, to one based on the notion of fields that extend through space. Um, or another example that most people are actually familiar with um, is the shift from cyclical orbits for the planets to elliptical orbits. And in all those cases, at the time, people thought that the new thing is really ugly. But today, um, physicists just accept it. It's just the way that it is. And I, I don't think they think about it as ugly. And so what happens if we insist on a particular type of beauty in the development of new models is that we get stuck. Um, so in, uh, in theoretical physics, our models are very, very mathematical and the type of beauty that theoretical physicists talk about um, is correspondingly um, basically mathematics. And I'm not going to explain exactly what I mean by those three hidden rules of physics, as I call them. Um, they are basically technical mathematical requirements that people use in theory development. Um, and they are um, hypothesis, um, but their status um, as a hypothesis has become forgotten. Uh, and, and that's the problem. I think this is why we've uh, gotten stuck. I should maybe say that this notion of simplicity, which physicists use, is very strongly based on symmetry. So it, it probably has an evolutionary origin to some extent. We just find symmetry pleasing to look at. And we see this in the development of new models in the foundations of physics. And that has consequences. Um, there are lots of lots of theories and predictions that have, have come out of theoretical physics um, based on arguments from beauty, um, based on asking certain questions um, about the theories that we currently use. They have perceived shortcomings because they're not beautiful enough. And there are lots of um, particles that physicists have proposed to remedy this perceived lack of beauty in the theories that we have, axion supersymmetry, string theory, you've probably heard of this. Uh, WIMPs is a particular type of dark matter um, and lots of other things that um, physicists have looked for in dozens and dozens of experiments and they haven't found anything. And I think, well, that's a problem. Um, so why do they do this? Well, like this is, I still find this perplexing, I have to say, um, because it's once you start thinking about it, it doesn't make any sense. Like, why would you expect your personal notion of beauty to be a good guide to the development um, of new theories? So, um, and I think there are a number of uh, reasons for this. One is social reinforcement. I already talked about this um, briefly in the beginning. It's just you hear it so often and no one questions it that you just accept it as true, like the same way they are, that I accepted it um, as true. There's also a certain lack of philosophical grounding because if you actually were aware that it's a metaphysical requirement that has no backup in, in evidence, then you might question it more readily. There's also a lot of cherry picking history. Um, if you think of these quotes, which um, I mentioned, like um, the one from Gellman and from Penrose, and you could add many others, Feynman already came up. Uh, there's also um, Paul Dirac, um, you, you could add him, and uh, a lot of other people that you can add there. Frank Wilczek, for example, has written an entire book about um, beauty in, in the foundations of physics. What do all those people have in common, aside from being men? Yeah. <laughs> um, they've all won a Nobel Prize. <laughs> so there's a certain selection bias. Um, we only take note of the people who have been successful and who then um, attribute their success to their sense of beauty. But in the history of physics, there have been lots of theories that were once considered beautiful that just didn't work. And on the other hand, there are lots of 
ugly theories that actually do work quite well. And finally, there's, uh, there are lots of cognitive biases. Um, it, for, for example, they're just... Um, some people who I interviewed just said, well, if it's not beautiful, I don't want to work on it. <laughs> and I mean, who am I to blame them, right? But this um, um, is a very strong selection for the kind of theory that we work on. Okay, um, so I don't know about you, but I would certainly like to see progress in the foundations of physics in my lifetime, which brings up the question, well, what to do? But I think the most basic thing we can do is uh, to increase awareness among working scientists. Um, I think that to be a good scientist, one needs some, a certain amount of knowledge about the history of science, the sociology, and the philosophy, which is why I think that events like this are really, really important. Thank you for your attention.